Hello and welcome to the Friday, March 15th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. We do have a diary today by Jan looking at a couple different options that are increasing in how attackers are storing assets for their phishing scams. And these two are IPFS and R2. Both of them have been going around for a while, but they keep increasing. IPFS, that's short for the Interplanetary File System, a distributed Web3 storage system, and then R2, which is object storage provided by Cloudflare. Either of them can be used free or really cheap, so attackers are using it for ephemeral storage. Often these URLs are rotating very quickly. By the time you noted a particular URL or blocked a URL, well, It's already gone and moved to somewhere else. IPFS is something that you may want to consider blocking wholesale. I don't really see it used much sort of for real stuff. Of course, that's much more difficult for Cloudflare. R2 is commonly used by a number of valid applications and companies. R2.dev is the domain associated with it. So you may want to Keep an eye out for these URLs, but like I said, wouldn't recommend blocking them. And we have yet again updates for Fortinet users. Uh, first one is not so good news, and that's new vulnerabilities, this time in 40WLM. 40WLM, that's their wireless LAN manager. Horizon 3 published a blog post with details regarding four different vulnerabilities. One is an unauthenticated command injection. We have unauthenticated SQL injection, unauthenticated arbitrary file read, and lastly, an authenticated command injection. Bad news here is that at least two of these vulnerabilities have not yet been patched. Horizon 3 originally reported these vulnerabilities to Fortinet back in May last year. And now after their 307 days of uh, notification expired, they did publish the details regarding these vulnerabilities. Yesterday, I mentioned uh, vulnerabilities in the 40 client EMS uh, This particular vulnerability is, of course, patched. There is now on GitHub someone advertising for sale and exploit. I doubt it's real. We haven't, as of earlier today, not seen any actual exploitation yet. However, Horizon 3 also announced that next week they will do a blog post with all the details. So this is certainly something that you need to address before this weekend. Again, that's 40 client EMS. 40 client EMS is sometimes exposed to the internet, not really all that common, uh, but certainly out there. The good news with the wireless LAN manager is that at least according to Horizon 3, they only saw a couple instances uh, being exposed uh, to the internet. And by a couple, I mean, I think it was less than 10. And if you aren't busy enough patching Fortinet, another set of devices that you absolutely need to patch quickly is the ArcSurf UDP, the Unified Data Protection Software. We have a blog post from Tenable releasing details regarding three different vulnerabilities that were just patched. And yes, the release does include a proof of concept exploit. The problem here is also that we have two different vulnerabilities that really can be chained for complete system compromise. One is an authentication bypass, so that's how an attacker originally gets accessed, and then can execute using the path traversal vulnerability, any action as that user where they bypassed authentication for. So this means these two vulnerabilities together give you full system access. The interesting thing about the authentication bypass is that essentially an attacker just needs to send a request without password and that will get the attacker authenticated. Well, it's a Friday again. I do have with me another sans.edu student, uh, Michael Holcomb. Uh, Could you introduce yourself, please? 
Yeah, uh, I'm Michael or uh, Mike Holcomb. I uh, currently am the floor fellow uh, at, uh, I might imagine, floor. Uh, we're one of the world's largest uh, engineering and construction companies. So very fortunate in my role to to help also lead the control system cybersecurity practice. So I get to work with uh, some of the best engineers in the world on some of the largest projects in the world. So um, I can hopefully was able to bring that experience to to the work through through SANS and in uh, the different courses that uh, I took and the uh, thesis, of course. Yeah, and uh, your paper, I I really liked it. And you already mentioned Thanks. that you're sort of in the industrial control space. Usually when you think about construction and such, you're thinking about, you know, big excavators and such and uh, – People sure. <laughs> with lots of muscles kind of moving heavy stuff around. Uh, it's not sort of, yeah. they usually expect right. uh, IT, uh, but of course, uh, IT is everywhere, data is everywhere. Uh, can you explain a little bit uh, what your paper was about? Yeah, my paper kind of really went to focus on on one item and, and kind of came up with, with two uh, that I like to, two different, I guess, findings that, that I like to, to focus on. You know, in general, in in ICS or OT environments, uh, there's kind of this understanding that when you look at what we call PLCs or programmable logic controllers, these are these are the main, if you want, specialized computers we have in OT or critical infrastructure environments. So if I have, let's say, a power plant, and in that power plant, you know, I have uh, turbines that turn, and in turn, those will Turn. I use turn a lot. Turn a generator that that creates electricity. Those those systems are controlled by these PLCs. It's just like the thermostat in your your house. You know, the thermostat set to a specific degree, and it does a, a job where it's programmed that oh, if it gets too warm, you know, past where you set the temperature to to be, it sends a signal out a little wire to your air conditioning unit to to turn on the air and, and cool down the room. It will then continually take the temperature, realizes, okay, the room is back to normal, you know, the n normal temperature that we've set. It sends another signal. Okay, we'll turn off the air conditioner. That's an example of a PLC. So whether it's at home or in a power plant, it's essentially the same same thing. Um, and so with PLCs, we've had a few incidents over the years, and, and the one thing most people like to highlight is the Trident or, or Trisis incident. I was actually taking uh, Rob Lee Sands course, the grid course during Trisis. So he actually had his Dragos team on the ground uh, doing the investigation and the response while this was happening. So this was probably the best thing that ever happened for my, my ICS OT career. You can't, can't pay for that type of kind of experience and, um, uh, uh, being able to get kind of that play-by-play -play from Rob a little bit behind the scenes. It was really exciting. Um, but with Trident or Trisis, that's where the you know Russian nation state had come into a petrochemical facility owned and operated by Saudi Aramco. And in that case, the the attackers were in the environment for, for months, if not years, and we're able to get to what they call the SIS, which is a set of other controllers like like the PLCs. And so in that situation, and this is kind of where at least I see it across the industry, there people believe that if you set those controllers or PLCs to what they call run mode, that um, a, an attacker is not able to remotely manipulate the system. Right. So they couldn't, you know, in the home example, they can't, you know, turn your air conditioner down to 60 degrees while you're on vacation in the middle of the summer or in the power plant example. Right. They couldn't, let's say, shut down the, the power plant. Um, and so there's this idea that you want to keep all of your controllers and systems in run mode. And, and what there is, is in, I always say, more expensive models right <laughs> that of of these types of systems there's a physical key switch that you would put into these systems and you would turn into run mode and people think of that as kind of like read only mode so i can pull information from that system but i can't change the programming and i can't update or upload a new firmware that could potentially have malicious code built into it so, and in the example of the Trident 
uh, incident. And th that's true on those, those nice expensive models that if you had your key switch in run mode, that an attacker wouldn't be able to remotely manipulate that system. I think where I came from looking at, you know, most environments out there, most OT environments, they're not those larger environments with the, the, the more expensive types of systems that you, know, you don't need those. They're, you know, small, manufacturing facilities, their water treatment, right, and wastewater and rail and mines. And, and so a lot of those PLCs and other controllers we see out there, they don't have a physical key switch to even monitor. Most of them might have like a little dip switch or they don't have any type of switch at all. And it's all controlled through software remotely <laughs> so that's always another way for attackers to be able to to slip in and so again going back to i guess the, the original question where the research was going was was looking at you know with plcs and just controllers and in, in general you know looking at that the key switch in in general which allows us to control Again, whether it's in run mode or what they call the operational mode. So is it in run mode or is it in in different controllers, call them, you know, have different modes and, and call them different things. So most will have two modes. So you have, you know, run or read only mode if you want. And then the others might have stop mode or they might call it program mode. And then you have a couple other variations, but there's always those, those two modes. And so a lot of people, again, in the industry say, keep it in in run mode and then you're you're protected well what i found is doing the research in a couple of plcs that i and had others but i ran out of room in the paper <laughs> but the idea is um you know i would have plcs in run mode. these are plcs that are commonly used in like manufacturing especially in, in north america and i would be in run mode and i would go to make a change to the plc programming code and it would actually let you it would ask you, hey, you're in run mode and you want to make a change to the PL PLC programming. Are you sure you want to do this? And you'd be like, yes. And it's like, okay, we'll let you make the change. So it wasn't stopping me from making a change to the programming code while it was in run. Or again, what people think of is read read only mode. Is it and, really yeah. more that this run mode feature is not so much a security feature? It's really more sort of performance that you know these PLCs are very time critical and uh, so you basically want to protect the CPU resources that they're dedicated to actually running the code versus worrying about updates. I think that's a big part of it. Like you like you point out, it's not meant as a security feature. I think from a security perspective, what I did see, at least with the the models that I tested, was that if you were in run mode, that it while you could make PLC programming changes, you weren't able to upgrade or upload a new piece of firmware. So, so there is that, if you want, level of security. So, so there is some benefit. It's just not as much as a lot of people assume, I think, in the, in the industry. And, and then, yeah. and then the other piece was, yeah, it's it, people not understanding a lot of the more commonly used I think, PLCs out there. They don't, they don't have key switches, right? And the, the environments don't have those more expensive models. They have these smaller models that that they can afford, and that's all they need. Um, and so the other idea was, we understand there's still some benefit of making sure that the PLCs stay in run mode, and that if they ever come out of run mode, it means my, ideally somebody's doing maintenance in an authorized change window, and that's great. Or what if it is an attacker? Right, it's going to be rare, but it could happen. And so then part of the other the rest of the research was putting together uh, essentially a, a little web app to monitor different PLCs and different PLCs communicate and share that operational mood information differently. But for these two. PLCs uh, to understand it was a click PLC and a Allen Bradley Rockwell automation uh, MicroLogics A20, right? To to be able to remotely determine what state they're in, and then if that if any of those PLCs ever comes out of run mode, then it sends the operator an alert to tell them they need to investigate. Okay. Unless it's you know they can say oh it's an authorized change window, great. You know, we can move on. A technician is doing their work. 
But then, oh, what if it's not an authorized change window? Then, well, someone's either doing something that they're not, right? And maybe it's just a technician that's doing work outside of a change window. Maybe it is an attacker. Or more than likely, it's probably some type of operational issue that they need to respond to and address. Maybe the PLC is having issues and, and maybe it needs to be replaced. But for whatever reason, if that PLC comes out of run mode, they need to investigate. So there are solutions out there that monitor for the key switch position, which again is great if you have key switches, but a lot of environments don't. So it's you, know, you can just monitor for if it comes out of run mode in general and then go into investigation mode. Yeah, and I, I thought that part was really interesting about the paper. You sort of reverse engineered a little bit of protocol and you know, how you can actually remotely figure out whether or not or what mode the device is in. Uh, one one quick question about that key switch and dip switch and such. Yeah. Uh, does it actually make sense to have that physical switch and have that in run mode if you also need to regularly update the firmware on these devices? Like, would this require someone crawling across the factory or the power plant to set all the switches, then you apply the update, and then you have to go back? Uh, is this sort of a feasible operating model? Or Yeah, no, that was a great question. So firmware... In in envir- you know, in OT environments, in, in power plants and railways and mines, et cetera, th- they don't get updated that often. It's very rare um, for them. It, you might go years uh, without them being updated. So you'll you'll have PLC programming changes more often than you would have firmware upgrades. You know the 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 firmware upgrades themselves. It's you know unless there's some significant operational gain. Um, or security issue, but but almost it's it's going to be an operational gain that that you would do do that upgrade. So we're, we don't often see upgrades performed for security reasons in OT environments, and we usually say you know with PLCs that's good enough. I always hate that phrase, <laughs> but it's good enough security because those PLCs are so deep within the OT network that it takes time for an attacker to to get there. And then ideally, ideally in a perfect world, right, which we know doesn't exist, but you're doing incident detection and, and you're able to find the attacker before they even get to the PLC, which I think as, as Rob Lee had just pointed out that less than 5% of OT environments globally are, are doing uh, incident detection. Mm-hmm. So that kind of gives you a little bit of that picture that um yeah if if uh, hey, that's a whole other story <laughs> you know, that's a so it's a whole other that's a whole book i guess all right I, but but your script basically on. is sort of a very first step in incident detection hey let's at least check if someone is changing the mode on these devices we are not necessarily going to worry about checksums exactly. of code running on the devices or things like this but uh, just if an attacker is hitting us they're probably going to try to put these devices into programming mode to get some more persistent exploit going or to be able to make changes exactly yeah and you, you know there's a lot of great platforms out there but they also cost a lot of money so the environments that have these kind of i guess if you want to say entry level plcs they're not going to have the money to to go buy those platforms. So I think it's just you know, it was just demonstrating. Here's you can create these tools. I created everything with ChatGPT. I realize you know I've always tried to be a developer. I <laughs> finally realized that that's just not me. And uh, so I had a lot of fun actually playing with ChatGPT to create these uh, Python scripts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even generate the the web page and, and do a Flask little web app. And um, it, it was honestly, it was su- super easy. Um, it was scary, you know, how how easy it was to create these scripts with with ChatGPT and and sending specific broadcast packets with specific payloads and and you know uh, being able to parse the return responses to understand what it's seen. I, it, yeah, it, it literally didn't take much much time or effort at all. So that's great. I still have to look at the source code for security vulnerabilities. Not that the web app has 
new issues. <laughs> well, yeah, and then, and then you can ask ChatGPT, right, to find, are there any, you know, security vulnerabilities in the script? And it, it can kind, I think it can kind of, from what I've, you know, yeah. heard, heard, it can kind of find yeah. find issues. It's not not. I, perfect, I did some experiments but... and found that ChatGPT is better from a security point of view than Stack Overflow. So... <laughs> Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Anything is better, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, sure. thanks. Uh, a link to the paper will be in the show notes. So if anybody's interested, that, I think the entire escapee stuff, there's a ton of stuff in this paper. Uh, so uh, great work here, uh, Michael. And yeah, thanks uh, Thank for you. joining me here. And that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks to everybody who's recommending this podcast, leaving us good reviews and doing anything uh, to get us a couple more listeners. Thanks and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.